and shared floor is then all yours. So hello, well, welcome everyone to our second uh, lecture about the, the technologies for emerging technology adoption and use course. Yesterday we went into the miracles of augmented reality and, and today we're go going to go to the wonders of blockchain with Kier Finlow Bates. And Kier has, uh, thank you so much for joining us this year again. So last time you were with us was two years ago. And I think that was the first time when this course went by the name Emerging Technology Adoption and Use. And uh, everyone really loved <laughs> your, your presentation. So that's why we really wanted to have, have you again to get your insights and best know-how for, for this topic. And um, yeah, we have one and a half hours, uh, but that uh, you can spend how little or how much time <laughs> you want in this kind of a time frame. And it, we might have people dropping in uh, gradually. And if you have any questions for the audience or anything, just, just be, feel free. But otherwise, the floor is all yours. Thank you for joining. Great. Uh, thanks very much, Henry. So uh, I'm Keir Finlow Bates, uh, and because we're in an academic environment, I can actually call myself Dr. Keir Finlow Bates, which I don't normally do. Uh, I have a maths and information engineering degree from Cambridge and a PhD in maths and education from London South Bank University. And I used to be a maths lecturer there for a couple of years, so I'm not completely unfamiliar with the academic environment. And after that, I went into the software industry, uh, first as a technical writer and then as a test engineer. And <clears throat> finally, about uh, six years ago now, uh, I started my own company to investigate blockchain. And I'd been looking at Bitcoin and then blockchain before that, but 2000, end 2015 marks the start of my full-time blockchain adventure. And to be honest, in the last six years, it's changed an awful lot. Uh, three or four years ago, I used to wake up in the middle of the night wondering if it was actually going to go anywhere or I deluded myself into believing that this technology was significant. I think it's pretty evident now that blockchain is here to stay and it's going to form one of these sort of pillars of technology like databases or um, the World Wide Web and the Internet. Uh, or even just the humble PC. So uh, today's talk, I will be touching on some of the technical issues surrounding blockchain, but only to explain it further. And uh, the idea behind this talk is not that we start digging into code and discussing uh, architecture designs. And I'm not going to be presenting large numbers of slides with lots of boxes interconnected with arrows. Instead, I'm trying to kind of convey the meaning behind blockchain. So uh, we'll move on to the first slide. And if you ask a technical person, what is blockchain? From a purely technical perspective, the answer you'll get is it's a very inefficient, very slow distributed database. It's uh, fundamentally at its base level. It's a system for storing data in a way that you can therefore retrieve data from it. And it does this in a very cumbersome um, append only manner. And as a result, if you're looking at it, just considering technical issues and nothing else, it's a very bad solution. It's slow, it's um, memory and disk space uh, consuming and uh, transactions take a long time to process by database standards. And so then the question would be, well, why do we bother with blockchain? And the answer there is, um, is that it's, uh, it's not about the technology. Blockchain doesn't actually solve a technological problem. It solves a, a social problem and a, almost a psychological problem. It's to do with how people interact rather than with how machines interact. And of course, underneath all of this, uh, we are using machines, we're using computers and networks in order to um, handle the data transfers and transactions for us. But ultimately, it's about allowing people to transact. And that's where blockchain 
um, actually comes into its own, the space that it occupies. So this is the thing to keep in mind during this talk. We're looking at a technical solution to a social problem. And I'm going to be dealing with some of the issues surrounding uh, those problems. So we're going to be looking as much at kind of sociology and psychology in a way as we are at technology. So I, th I think it's important to kind of get that uh, basis or that ground rule set in place before we start talking. Otherwise, it gets confusing. So a blockchain offers a, as it says here, a censorship resistant ledger with clearly defined identity and access management. And the meaning of blockchain has kind of evolved over the last 10 years. When we started off back in 2010 with Bitcoin, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, the uh, inventor of uh, the first blockchain, was looking at a very specific problem. And it's kind of expanded outwards from there. It's, it's one of these technologies that when you first encounter it and you start investigating it, you get the sense that there's, there's got to be a lot more value to this than is uh, first evident, than first meets the eye. And uh, that's what we've actually seen over the last 10 years and the way that it's evolved. Um, and I'll be discussing some of the history later on in this talk too. So um, let's look at those issues that I raised in that previous slide. We've got censorship, which is um, the ability of a centralized party to prevent your transactions or delete your account or even rewrite the past. And when you look at a centralized system, such as, for example, a banking database, or a social media site run by a large Silicon Valley company, um, they have an immense amount of control. Your bank can decide to block a financial transaction that you try to make. Uh, this happened to me when I was on holiday in Egypt. I hadn't told Nordia that I was uh, going to be leaving Finland and going over to Egypt. And so their systems detected that suddenly, instead of spending money in Tampere, I was using my card to spend money in Hogada in Egypt. And to protect me, in quotes, they blocked my uh, card. Now, that is a well-meant form of censorship. Um, it did, unfortunately, cause me a lot of inconvenience at the time. A worse form of censorship would be when your bank actually decides that you should not be allowed to use what is supposed to be your money to buy something that you want to. So, for example, there were people in the United States who were trying to use their debit cards to buy cryptocurrency, and their banks had decided that cryptocurrency was a bad thing. So they were blocking transactions with cryptocurrency selling exchanges. And I would argue that that is not a well-meant form of censorship at all. The bank may think yet again that they're protecting you, but they're using their centralized control over your finances to stop you engaging in a transaction that you want to. And of course, if you have cash on the other hand, uh, then there is no central authority that can directly stop you. And admittedly, if you're involved in some kind of criminal activity, then the police can swoop in and arrest you. But for everyday exchanges, cash has a property that um, banking doesn't have, which is that it's decentralized and it's under your control rather than some other parties. Um, the second issue here with regards to censorship is that if you have a centralized system, such as a social media site, they can arbitrarily decide to delete your account. You may think it's your account on your social media site, but of course it's actually not. And we saw a case of this recently where uh, Facebook, after rebranding to Meta, decided to uh, delete the account of an Instagram account holder because she'd called her uh, account Metaverse. And they did some quick backpedaling when this went public and there was a lot of uh, bad press about it. But the fact is that if she hadn't managed to get the newspapers of the world to pick up on it and uh, run the story, then she probably never would have got her account back. So uh, these are some of the issues we see with centralized systems. And one of the things that uh, blockchain is aiming to solve is this resistance to censorship. Because it's a decentralized system, there's no 
central controlling party that can decide that you, what you can and cannot do arbitrarily. Um, however, the flip side of this is that blockchain does have a set of rules that everybody has to uh, follow. Um, a particular blockchain will have a protocol that says transactions have to have this format, they have to be uh, checked for validity, and this is what constitutes a valid transaction. And as long as you obey all those rules, then the system is designed in such a way that your transaction will go through. Um, so uh, a final thing about censorship is that uh, there's a ris risk in centralized control again, that history can be rewritten. So you can go back and look at things that happened in the past and change them, rewriting history. And for example, if you have an administrator of a database, they have complete control over the content of that database so they can go back and change transactions or change timestamps on transactions and as a result uh, they don't work very well as uh, reliable evidence that something happened at a particular time and one of the uh, results of the way that blockchains is, are designed is that um, they are what is called immutable now there's some extra complications there but for all practical um, purposes, if you have a record of transactions on a blockchain, the further back in the past they are, the harder it is to rewrite them to the point where it becomes computationally impossible for you to change um, something that happened um, in the distant past. And again, this gives us a whole bunch of properties that we can start investigating and using. It's particularly relevant, for example, in the world of um, registering uh, rights, such as intellectual property rights. Um, in the world of, for example, copyright or patenting, something called a priority date is very important. The first person to disclose an invention gets to invention, for example, gets to be identified as the inventor of that invention and therefore gets certain rights towards that invention. Um, similarly with copyright, if you publish your book if you can prove that you did it on a certain date, then somebody coming on along later can't say, well, actually, I'm now going to publish it on this date and it's my book. You, you will have a record saying, well, no, I published it at this time. And blockchains are starting to be used for that kind of thing, for registering rights and for uh, forming a, a notary service effectively. And at the moment we use either um, witnesses or professional notaries or registration services there's a possibility that in the future a lot of these services will move to blockchains and the second issue which was the one that used to be held up as the kind of prime reason for blockchain existing is uh, the charges of the middleman so the idea that at the moment we rely a lot on brokers and um, kind of intermediaries who charge us a lot of money in order to provide us with a service and the one of the intentions behind blockchain was that we could reduce these costs by removing these gateway parties who can use their controlling influence to extract a lot of money from us for those services. Um, and similarly, hiding mistakes. If everything is out there on a blockchain and anybody can get a copy of it and go and read it, it becomes harder for people to hide that they're doing something nefarious or that they've made a mistake and uh, try to cover it up. So uh, I'll just go through a quick history of blockchain. Uh, sometimes you'll hear people say, oh, well, you know, there's nothing new about blockchain. Everything that uh, a blockchain is made of has been invented before. And on one level, that is correct. Uh, blockchain is built on a whole history of uh, computing and mathematics and cryptography. And I've listed here some of the significant kind of um, landmarks in that. We have uh, uh, some stuff to do with number theory. We go back about a hundred years, um, Hardy and uh, Ramanujan particularly, mathematicians who were working on stuff that's relevant. Uh, and then we have the emergence of information theory just after the second world war. And I put uh, Shannon down as the uh, key person to look at there. Uh, Shannon has a very uh, couple of very good, uh, quite understandable papers. Maybe I should dig out the links and provide them later. And then uh, hopefully you've all heard of Alan Turing, uh, who's sort of described as the 
father of modern computing. Uh, he dealt a lot with what computers might end up being. Uh, in the Second World War, he worked uh, for the British uh, Army, uh, cracking uh, the encryption of the uh, German Army uh, using, uh, well, initial computers, actually. And again, if you're ever in the UK and you get the chance to go to Bletchley Park, where he worked, they have an excellent museum on the emergence of computing in the United Kingdom. Uh, moving forward to about the 60s, we have computer networking and particularly uh, decentralized or distributed networking. And uh, Barron is the name to look for there. Uh, and this is looking at the American military's uh, attempts to set up uh, computing systems that were not centralized. The idea being that if you were attacked as a nation, there wouldn't be a central control center that could be knocked out thereby paralyzing your defenses. If you distribute all this stuff um, across the uh, geography of your nation, then uh, if one part's taken out, the rest can still function. So um, ironically, the whole internet actually partially emerged from uh, military research to try to make the defense of particular nations uh, more effective. Then we have databases, which are also an important part of blockchain because they're an efficient way of storing information. And uh, COD is the guy who I think came up with the first database. And then there's a neat amount of work by um, someone called Brewer uh, proving all sorts of properties of databases. So if you're interested in proof and databases, go and check out him. He had something called the CAP theory, which tells you um, how uh, the kind of service you can expect from a database, uh, because there are these trade-offs in databases uh, with regard to the speed that you'll get an answer, the likelihood of that answer being accurate, and how well a database, if it's distributed across a network, can cope with bits of the network going down. And then we get on to the really complicated part, which is cryptography. And if you're going to dig into that, you need to have a good mathematical background in algebra. And I've listed a whole bunch of names here because there's all sorts of relevant stuff in there. And then finally, in the 90s, we actually saw a social phenomenon emerging, which was a bunch of um, cryptography enthusiasts uh, getting together and discussing ideas about how cryptography could be used uh, to protect the identity, and to um, start dealing with uh, money, how we actually conduct trade and how our finances work. And uh, I've listed a number of names there. And then finally at the uh, end of the 2000s, uh, somebody anonymous called, uh, calling themselves Satoshi Nakamoto uh, published a paper on uh, Bitcoin, which was their presentation of a uh, decentralized distributed electronic cash system. Um, and that's the thing that really kicked off all the blockchain stuff. And yes, Nakamoto's work is a combination of all the previous stuff that I've talked about. But just because all the pieces existed beforehand uh, doesn't actually, in my opinion, lessen the achievement of putting them together in a new and um, original manner and in such a way that something emerges that has all sorts of amazing and wonderful properties. So uh, that's a quick run through of history. You could probably give a two hour lecture on the whole history of blockchain um, because uh, as is the case with all human invention, it just builds on top of previous stuff and it gets, um, and we kind of often forget about the history behind pretty much all of the leading inventions that we have. But I, I shall move on from that very quick overview um, and talk a bit about vocabulary in the blockchain space. And this is something that has changed over the last decade. And here I'm trying to focus on the things that we're now really kind of interested in and focusing on in the uh, blockchain space. So I've got uh, uh, six words here, identity, trust, consensus, value, ownership, and token. And actually the odd one out there I think is token because the other things are all to do with human concepts about the world that we live in. And the interesting thing about them is some of these concepts have been examined and discussed by philosophers for thousands of years. And the ancient Greeks had long discussions about identity, for example. Um, so I'll, I'll be dealing with each of these 
individually over the uh, next few minutes. Um, unless there's anybody who'd like to ask a quick question before I move on to this. Of course, I'm in Finland, so there won't be any questions will there, right? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, let's deal with trust first. And the issue with trust is that it has many different meanings depending on the situation that you're talking about. And this results in the sometimes uh, conflicting definitions of blockchain technology when it comes to trust in that some people describe blockchain as being a trust building system and other people describe it as a trustless system. And when you first hear those two, you think to yourself, well, that's contradictory. How can something be both trust building and trustless? You, can, you can't have both at the same time, surely. And the issue there really is about how you interpret the meaning of the word trust. And so I've, I've got a definition here, confidence in what is going to happen. And uh, the reason why I've got a picture of an apple here <clears throat> is that gravity is something that we all implicitly trust. Your experience in the world is such that when things are dropped, they fall. And of course, this is therefore a reference to Newton and the apocryphal story of an apple falling out of a tree onto his head. And when you have something that you are so confident that it's going to happen, um, you don't really question it. Just it, it becomes sort of part of your internal psychological makeup. Nobody's surprised when an apple falls out of a tree and lands, uh, unless you have a particularly unusual and odd way of looking at the world, at which point you may actually go on to make an amazing discovery about um, the mechanics of uh, the universe. Um, a second way of viewing trust is that you consider the likelihood of something happening worth taking the risk that it won't happen. And uh, there we go from trust being sort of an absolute confidence in something into being a probabilistic one. So if I can give some examples here, um, I may have a friend who I trust, and that means that I know them so well that I know that I, for example, can lend them the keys to my car because I know that from experience that they're a good, reliable driver. Whereas I may have another friend who I don't trust uh, because I've seen how badly he drives and therefore I won't lend him the keys to my car. So that's a kind of confidence in what is going to happen. Um, Another example of trust might be that uh, you, know, you know that aeroplanes uh, undergo a rigorous testing process before they are allowed to be used as passenger aircraft. You know that there are all sorts of rules and regulations in place that require airlines to conduct all sorts of engineering tests and maintenance before the airplane is allowed to take off. And as a result, you know that the risk of an aircraft crashing is actually very low. It's one of the safest forms of transport we have. And therefore you have trust that this machine, this metal tube that's gonna lift you up into the sky and carry you halfway around the earth is worth trusting. You just get on and you uh, take off at Helsinki and you land in wherever it is you're going and you trust that it's going to be safe. Of course, it's not 100% safe, but the likelihood of it being safe is so high that it's worth the risk. Um, and as a result, we actually get in airplanes to go on holidays to places like Egypt to have our bank cards canceled by our banks. Anyway, um, so what blockchain does here is kind of like the latter example that I've given, which is that the sort of rules and regulations and protocols that are put in place are such that you can actually go and verify how it all functions. It functions like a machine where you can inspect all the parts. And as a result, you can make pretty solid predictions as to what the likelihood is of your transaction being successful. So if you look at something like Bitcoin, you can actually work out the probability of a transaction that makes it onto the blockchain actually remaining on the blockchain. And it sort of starts off if it's in the first block of it being, there being sort of a one chance in a thousand of it not being locked down. And by the time a couple of hours have passed, you know that the probabilities are of it not 
being recorded permanently in the blockchain are incredibly, incredibly low, so low that they're effectively zero. And that, in a sense, is what is meant by blockchain building trust. It's because you can inspect it, you can start actually putting a metric on what the reliability of it is, what the probabilities of it going wrong are, and therefore it falls in also in that category of considering the likelihood worth the risk. And as a result, because people like myself have gone and assessed um, how it functions, you can say, right, well, I don't even need to think about this anymore. Other people have investigated for me in the same way that an engineer has done the maintenance on the airplane. You don't personally have to go and look at the engine and the propellers or the uh, jet engine to know that it's going to work. You just trust it. And that is the sense that it becomes trustless, that uh, you no longer have to worry about it. Okay, well, I think that's probably enough on trust. Um, the next one is identity. And this is interesting because one of the things you can, um, one of the ways you can summarize what a blockchain is, is that it's a system that handles identity and access management. Um, blockchains are unusual in that unlike most of the software that we have out there, they were built from the ground up to handle um, our data in a secure manner. The problems that we're seeing with computer security, with uh, data breaches and hacks and things like that, is that a lot of the foundations that our computing systems are built on have had a security kind of tacked on as an afterthought. You know, when you had an, a home PC that was not connected to the internet, um, it was secured by virtue of the fact that it was sitting in your office or your uh, living room behind a locked door and therefore you didn't need to be able to log on to it in order to access it it was secure by the fact that nobody else could access it uh, once you started connecting these computers to the internet then who had access to what parts of the computer started becoming more important and those pieces were sort of added piecemeal rather than being baked into the underlying architecture of the system and with blockchain, this is very, very different because right from the very start, identity um, is of extreme importance. And the reason for that is that if you're going to implement a digital cash system, you need to have a very clear understanding of who owns what particular portion of cash. Um, when it comes to banknotes in my wallet, I own them because my wallet is in my pocket. Um, when you have a distributed computing system, such as Bitcoin, that is keeping a record of who owns what, um, you need to have a way of saying, well, this particular portion of a token belongs to this person. And that's set from the very beginning. So the thing to understand here about identity is that it doesn't mean that you have to be able to identify the particular person. It's not about saying Keir Finlow Bates owns one Bitcoin. It's about being able to say this particular entity who may or may not be identified in a kind of everyday practical sense, have a name assigned to them or an address where you can find them. Um, just that this particular address is the owner of this particular token and no other address is allowed to do anything with that token. Um, and at a future date when a transaction is submitted saying that now this token is going to be transferred from this identity to that identity, you know that you are dealing with the same identity that received the token in the first place. And I hope that didn't kind of get too convoluted and complicated. But it, what it boils down to is you need to, um, sort of consistency and persistence of who is doing what, even if you don't know who the who is. Okay. Um, so then the next term that I had on the list is this concept of consensus and this becomes very important because what you're trying to avoid is arguments between two parties where both of them are trying to have a claim to the same thing so uh, this is uh, in in england we have ongoing problems with neighbors arguing exactly about where the boundary between their two plots of land are and in finland it's neatly handed by them putting these orange metal things in the ground all over the place to mark out particular individual plots. Um, in the UK, uh, because record keeping wasn't very good in the Middle Ages when they started dividing up the land, 
and for some reason um, they kind of didn't neatly settle all this stuff, we, we have a lot of boundary disputes. And that boils down to a lack of consensus, two people disagreeing as to who owns what. And that's compounded by the fact that the legal systems uh, relying on the uh, historic precedent um, means that resolving some of these boundary issues can be very, very complicated. There's actually cases to be put forward that both parties are right. And uh, that's a problem when it comes to ownership because you can't really have two people completely owning the same thing. Um, you know, in, in, in the world, land, for example, is unique. You, you don't, we don't have parallel universes that we can enter where two people can occupy the same space at the same time and use this, the same piece of land. So it's important from a society point of view to be able to say, well, this is the person who has a right to that. And the um, term used to ensuring that we do have a common view of the world is this term of consensus. And in blockchain, there are a whole number of different um, practical technical solutions that are used to obtain this consensus. And in fact, uh, consensus in computing has a longer history than blockchain. And there's all sorts of work from the 80s and 90s. I think Lamport in particular is worth looking at for that, um, about how can you get two databases that are connected over an unreliable network to have the same data in them um, eventually. And that's the same problem that uh, blockchain is facing, is how can you get all these different blockchain nodes to have the same ledger or record of who owns what. And uh, Nakamoto came up with a very ingenious solution to it. It's called proof of work. And it relies on a number of different um, techniques in order to make it function. Uh, the main one being that the people who are maintaining the, uh, the databases, if you will, uh, are incentivized to ensure that they stay in sync, that they both agree that if, for example, a Bitcoin has been spent, that it has indeed been spent and therefore cannot be re-spent by the same person. Um, the uh, system ensures that that is the case by rewarding people who maintain the system to keep a, a single view of the world and punishing them if uh, they don't do that. And uh, that kind of touches on the core problem that Nakamoto was solving with Bitcoin, which is this thing called the double spend problem. Uh, if, if I walk into a shop with a five euro note and I buy a load of cake uh, and I walk out of the shop, the shopkeeper now has my five euro note and I have the cake and I can't go into another shop and spend that same five euro note because I don't have it anymore. The shopkeeper now has it. And it's such a uh, an intuitively obvious property of the real world that we don't even really think about it. Um, you know, if I give something to you, I no longer have it, you now have it. That, that uh, a child at the age of three understands that concept. Um, in the computing world, it's not so easy because in computing, you can digitally copy stuff at the press of a button. Um, so ensuring that there is, uh, that things are only possessed by one person at the same time is surprisingly hard. And that's actually fundamentally the problem that Nakamoto solved. Um, in a way that doesn't require you to have a central authority or an arbitrator who says, look, this is the person we trust to keep the records, to tell us exactly who owns what. Um, and that's traditionally the solution that we've used. That's why we have centralized banks and payment systems. And we give them the responsibility of making sure that when, for example, cash uh, money is spent, that it is truly spent and that it can't be re-spent by the same party. But that has all the problems that I talked about at the beginning of the uh, talk associated with it. Um, okay, value. Here's another one that uh, is in, in there's a lot of debate in the blockchain world. The question is, why are some of these tokens valuable? Um, why, why can we put a dollar price on uh, a Bitcoin? And you'll see some people saying, well, Bitcoin isn't, doesn't have any value because it has no um, intrinsic value. It has no inherent value. Um, as if this is some kind of revelation. Um, however, if you look at things such as money or gold, they have very little of any intrinsic value as well. In fact, you want your money to not have intrinsic value uh, because it makes, um, it sort of dilutes the ability of money to function as money. 
And then the example I give here is of gold, that uh, we use gold as a store of value and have done for thousands of years. And uh, it's a real problem for the electronics industry because gold actually has a use. It's a really good conductor. It's very corrosion resistant. And so it's really great for electronic connectors. Um, the problem is that we also use gold as this store of value, like a battery for putting value in so that it can be released later. And uh, as a result, gold becomes very expensive for the electronics industry, much more expensive than it should be when you look at other metals. Um, and uh, the electronics industry and therefore ultimately consumer has to bear the cost that has been, um, that has ensued from uh, gold being used as a store of value. Another example you can give is that we spend a lot of energy and we cause a lot of pollution in the process of digging gold up out of the earth. And I think it was Warren Buffett who said that uh, uh, gold is a strange thing because we, we go to a lot of trouble to dig it up. And then what do we do with it once we've refined it and cast it into bars? Well, we, we put it back in a hole and guard it. Um, so you know, a lot of energy, a lot of environmental damage caused in obtaining gold and storing it and protecting it. Um, but it gives you an indication of how useful a store of value is. And the, so this, a lot of the arguments that are leveled against cryptocurrencies as being um, damaging to the environment, although accurate, can equally be leveled towards uh, gold. And then the question becomes, is the damage or the energy expenditure that we have worth the benefits we get from it? And um, I'd say the jury's still out on that one. But then again, if you think about it, the jury's still out on that one when it comes to gold as well. So a little diversion into value there. Um, again, you can read a whole bunch of stuff on that. If you go and look online, there's people arguing both sides of the case. And uh, I don't think we're ever going to come to a definite conclusion. But in the meantime, it's fun to watch the arguments. And then finally, that word token. And in uh, the blockchain world, a token actually fundamentally boils down to an entry in a database or a row in a ledger. That's all the token is. When you see people talking about how their project is issuing tokens or you hear people talking about non-fungible tokens that they are going to buy, um, what they're actually talking about is a, an entry in a database in the form of a row in a ledger. So um, we have other examples of tokens in real life, casino chips. That's why I have these pictures here. They're tokens. They, when you go into a casino and you hand over a 50 euro note and you get a 50 um, uh, token marked with the number 50 on it, it's a representation of the 50 euro note that you handed in order to get it. With the idea being that later you can cash it back in and get your original 50 euros back. So they're kind of tokens often function as pointers to other things. And uh, I think at this point, it's therefore worth talking about what a ledger is. Is that what I've done? Yes. So um, ledgers. Well, one way of looking at a blockchain is that it's a gigantic distributed ledger that's keeping track of who owns what and um, then transactions that occur and when they occur and what their significance is. So um, we've been using ledgers for an awfully long time. The, there's records of the Sumerians um, in Mesopotamia about 4,000, 5,000 years ago, keeping track of who owned how much barley or oats or uh, honey uh, on clay tablets using uh, cuneiform marks. So those, that's kind of um, not quite prehistoric, but uh, ancient history. Uh, uses of ledgers and uh, the, the history of ledgers goes on and on and on. Accounting is a uh, profession built entirely on the use of and maintenance of ledgers and blockchains are fundamentally ledgers too because uh, they are recording transactions or events and changes of state and in particular they are used to record who owns how much of something and when they got that ownership or when they lost that ownership. So, uh, so here's a simple example of a spreadsheet keeping track of how much grain various people own. And you can see there, there's talking about Alice getting 30, Eve gets 30, and then later on Eve uh, spends five. And as a result, you can keep track of this ownership of real physical objects in this case in a virtual manner. And that leads me on to why ledgers are incredibly, incredibly useful. Um, 
ledgers allow people to own abstract things. Now, it's very easy for me to own a coin or a pen knife. I can carry it in my pocket and I own it because it's in my pocket and not yours. It's much harder for me to own something such as a song. Um, if I write a fantastic melody and put some lyrics to it uh, under copyright law, it's now my song. And if you want to perform it, you're supposed to pay me for the right or get permission from me. Um, similarly, if I invent something, uh, then how can I say that I own a particular invention? How can it be that a, a company owns a, a, a particular concept? Um, you can even ask questions about how we can own real things that it's not practical to carry around in your pocket. I you know, talked about land before. I mean, land is there, but uh, you can't, uh, it takes a lot of physical effort for me to assert my ownership, building a fence around it, maybe hiring guards to keep other people off it. Um, how do we keep a record of who owns what land? Well, we use a ledger. We have a land registry. Uh, how do we keep track of who owns a song or a poem or a book? Well, we have a copyright register. Um, how do we keep track of who owns how much money? Again, we use an accounting ledger. So ledgers are, in that sense, an amazing human invention and probably underappreciated by most people in everyday life um, in that they keep track of pretty much everything for us and including the ownership of abstract concepts. So this is what a blockchain does too. It's fundamentally a ledger. This is why you hear some people talking about distributed ledger technology, because it's a way of maintaining a record of who owns what without having to have a centralized land registry or a centralized copyright registry or something like that. Or in this case, in, in cryptocurrencies case, a centralized register of money ownership. Um, and the thing about ledgers is, they record ownership, but they only work if everybody agrees that the ledger is to be respected. And I guess here an example would be if you have a country which has got a ledger recording who owns what land and that country is then invaded and a foreign power takes control, that foreign power may decide to redistribute land to um, the people on its side rather than people who were there before. So, uh, for example, in the United Kingdom, well, in England, uh, in 1066, when William the Conqueror invaded and won, um, one of the first things he did was hand loads of land and nobility titles and stuff onto uh, his followers. And uh, a lot of people on the losing side found that suddenly they were no longer uh, the Duke of this or the Earl of that or the uh, Baron of this place. Um, they lost their ownership of titles and land. And of course, titles are abstract concepts and uh, land, although physically real, the ownership of land is an abstract concept too. So uh, the ledgers work if everybody respects the meaning of the ledger. And as a result, this meaning has to be built up somehow. And this is one of the things that we've seen with things such as Bitcoin is that more and more people are starting to respect the meaning of the ledger and are respecting the meaning of value being assigned to the tokens that it builds. Um, so uh, that's why you can put a dollar price on a Bitcoin. There's a marketplace out there that says there are people who are willing to buy it for a certain price. They, people respect the meaning of the ledger. Um, one further thing about uh, blockchains is that they, the, we put meaning uh, onto the tokens that are on them. However, it's no longer a question of uh, us all as a society having to respect the ownership of that token because it's written there in an immutable manner and we know that nobody can go in and tamper with it and change it to, to be owned by somebody else. So in a sense, it's kind of moving one step beyond the traditional sense of the ledger again. Right. Um, I shall take a short break to have some uh, liquid, if I may. Uh, so if there are any questions at this point, please uh, feel free to ask. Nope, it's the usual oh. silence. <laughs> there seems to be one in the in the chat. Can you oh, is there? Ask? I can't see the chat because I'm presenting. So maybe you could uh, read it out to me. Yeah, so what do you think? Which of these better, UTXO or, or account-based model? Or does each of these have its specific use case? If so, what are the use case then, in short? And can okay. be more dominant in the future? 
Right. So I think the question here is talking about um, how do you model the transaction? And this is where the, the traditional way of a ledger keeping a balance is that, uh, which is actually used by the Ethereum blockchain for its native cryptocurrency token, uh, Ether, is that you have a balance recorded against a particular owner. And then if that owner spends some of it, you subtract the amount spent from their balance and you add that same amount to the receiver. And that kind of maintains, that's like the conservation of mass of ledgers in a sense, is that every time you increase a balance somewhere, you have to decrease a balance somewhere else. Um, the Bitcoin blockchain uses a different model, which is this uh, concept of unspent transactions, where uh, when I receive Bitcoins, what I, uh, it's kind of hard to explain. Um, when I spend a Bitcoin, what I'm doing is I'm sending a transaction that says, um, I can now no longer spend this particular amount of Bitcoin and somebody else receives that as an unspent transaction. Um, and they therefore have the right to spend it later on. So it's kind of like a pay it forward concept. Um, I have a whole section on it in my book, actually. If I just, I don't know if you can see that. There's a good chapter on that. I use an analogy with cups of sand where uh, each, um, each, uh, owner of Bitcoin effectively has a cup full of sand and each grain of sand represents a Satoshi, which is the smallest unit of a Bitcoin. And then when they spend it, they are pouring it out and then somebody else is receiving it in a cup. And now I have a upended cup with nothing in it and somebody else has a new cup that's full of sand and you just keep pouring it onwards and onwards. Um, as to the benefits of the two, um, well, the balance method is simpler to explain, so it has that going for it. The um, transaction, uh, the unspent transaction model, I, it's kind of a, it's a bit of an intractable problem, I think, really. It's like, it would depend on the particular uses you want to put it to. So uh, uh, Bitcoin, it's tied up with the way that scripting works for being able to produce transactions. And um, so, yeah, that's a hard one to answer. <laughs> um, I mean, the downside of the UTX model is that you have to pass the whole ledger to keep track of who owns how much. It's very difficult on Bitcoin to know exactly what the balance of a particular address is unless you go through the entire ledger. Um, and so there are services out there where they actually index all this stuff in a database for you so it's much quicker to keep track of um, the upside is that you get a lot more scripting capabilities or you can do a lot of clever automation stuff that with a balance system becomes a bit harder so uh, i think i'll leave it at that but um yeah that's a good question and maybe Antti, i'm not sure if you also have a own opinion about it but i think that kind of a the questions are extremely good also for group assignments in general to mm. look potentially more into the use cases. What would each kind of open? What would be the beneficial aspects about them under different circumstances? But uh, yeah, mm -hmm. good, question. yeah. <laughs> good question. Yes, in fact, you could give that as an assignment. We'll sort of start off with what are the differences between the two? Why are they significant? And what are the use cases for each? Um, and to be honest, I can't come up with a great answer off the top of my head at the moment. I know what they are. Um, and I think Nakamoto used a UTX model because of scripting purposes for this automation purposes. But then again, Ethereum uses the balance one and it has wonderful uh, capabilities too. So it may, it may tie into Bitcoin not having a Turing complete scripting language. Uh, whereas, so you can't iterate across balances as easily because you won't know when it will terminate. So it may connect in with that. But anyway, yeah, maybe I'll leave that for uh, Henry to set as an assignment to somebody who feels like a challenge. Um, so uh, we're going, gosh, already uh, 40 minutes, I think. No more than that, isn't it? We're coming up to an hour. Um, I've got a brief section here on different types of blockchains. And one of the things you'll notice when you go and look at the blockchain world is that there are an awful lot of blockchains out there now. Um, 
And this is not surprising because if you go and look at databases, you'll find there's an awful lot of databases out there. And uh, of course, there are ones that are heavily promoted by individual companies that are making uh, their profits off them. And then there are also a whole bunch of open source ones. That, and the thing is that for blockchains, just as for databases, <clears throat> the fundamental uh, differences usually boil down to focusing on different issues. Um, sometimes it's just because people like the idea of having a different architecture because they think it's more elegant. Um, most of the time it's because they're trying to solve a particular problem that they perceive in the blockchain industry, real or not. And so some of them are technical in nature, some of them are actually community influenced in nature. Um, when Sometimes you might be asked by someone, well, what blockchain should I use for my particular problem? And in fact, there's, there's looking at the capabilities of a particular blockchain, but then there's also, more importantly, I think, looking at the actual ecosystem surrounding it, because it's all very well having a wonderful technical solution. But if you don't have an ecosystem for developers and tools for it, and it doesn't have a big community using it, and it doesn't have a reputable team backing it, then it's probably not a good choice, and particularly in blockchain, because ultimately blockchains are about this community. The bigger the community using it, um, the more value it starts to have. It starts to uh, accrete or attract. Um, a blockchain with only one node and one user is completely and utterly pointless. If you're doing that, then you may as well use a database. And that immediately tells you that sort of as a corollary, the size of the community using it, the network effect is going to significantly impact the value of a particular blockchain. And uh, if you look at networks, it's like for um, the, you have the nodes, the people using the network, if you consider them as a graph, and then you have the edges, which is the connections that can exist between the nodes. And uh, um, the, every time you add a node, the number of edges dramatically increases and it grows. Um, is it quadratically? I think it's quadratically. So uh, just a small increase in the size of the community means that the different number of potential transactions that could occur between parties uh, kind of explodes in size. So um, in blockchains, it's important to have a big community using it. That's where the value ultimately comes from, a community all agreeing that... Uh, um, this is a particular worldview that they want to have. Um, and you'll see a whole bunch of problems that uh, blockchains try to address. The big one that comes up again and again and again is transaction speeds. A lot of blockchains are considered to be very slow in their ability to handle transactions. And uh, therefore, you know, you'll hear people say, oh, the Bitcoin can only handle seven transactions a second. Um, similarly, there's the settlement rate, which is how long it takes before you can trust that your transaction is locked down. And again, if we pick Bitcoin as an example, blocks come along on average every 10 minutes. If you really are dealing with a huge sum of Bitcoin, then you need to wait a couple of hours before the probability of it being rewritten is incredibly low. Um, there's some that look at the kind of transactions you want to conduct. If it's transferring the ownership of a token from one person to another, that's not a particularly complex transaction. On the other hand, you may have all sorts of uh, uh, transactions where you want to have multiple signers to agree that the transaction is valid. You may want the transaction to split off to multiple parties. You may want to time lock a transaction so that some asset is locked up and then unlocked a year or a decade later. Um, so there's that issue. Uh, centralized control is one because we talk about blockchains being decentralized. Um, you have things at the sort of if you think of um, centralized databases run by, say, a bank, you know, there's complete centralized control there. If you look at something like Bitcoin, you have a high level of decentralization, although there is still a certain amount of influence in the hands of the miners of the blockchain. Um, there are ones that kind of fall across the spectrum. So you may have a proof of stake blockchain where there's a small number of token holders who get to decide which transactions get added. Um, so it's not as decentralized as uh, something such as Bitcoin. Um, different blockchains have different energy consumptions uh, that you can estimate. Uh, proof of work blockchains uh, are ones where the energy consumed is high. Proof of stake is much, much lower on the energy consumption, but they tend to be more 
centralized. So you have to ask yourself, how much energy do I want to spend in order to get this a certain level of censorship resistance? Um, and then other blockchains may focus on anonymous transactions. So uh, people think some people think that Bitcoin is anonymous. It's pseudo anonymous in that if you're careful, you can hide your identity, but it is still possible through a bit of investigation to start linking transactions and then starting to work out who was actually behind a particular transaction. And uh, this is the same kind of technique the police have used for ages, where maybe they're not allowed to listen to individual phone calls, but they can track who made a phone, uh, what number made a phone call to what other number and how long they talked for. And this starts to allow them to build a bigger picture as to what is, for example, going on inside a criminal gang without knowing all the members of that gang and then slowly uncovering them one by one. So uh, the same kind of thing can be done through forensic investigation on blockchains. And in an open transparent blockchain, it's particularly easy because every single transaction is visible. So you can just start doing data analysis on it. Uh, there are blockchains out there that use cryptographic techniques such as zero knowledge proofs so that nothing is actually revealed on the blockchain. And it's, they're really quite fascinating to look at because you're sort of saying you want to be able to know for sure that somebody's good to pay for something without actually telling the world how much they own. Uh, so it's, it's kind of like saying, you know, I, I know this person can afford to buy that car, even though I do not know what their bank balance is. So there's some very clever uh, stuff going on under the hood there to make that possible. Um, now, people will talk about the participants in blockchains and they'll start talking about client nodes and archive nodes and orderers. If you go and look at Hyperledger, for example, it gets very complicated very quickly. Transaction processors and settlement nodes. Um, I think an easy way to look at is, oh, I think we jumped to there, is to look at the participants in terms of what they're trying to achieve. So in a blockchain, you have people who just simply want to send transactions. I want to own something and then later on, I use it to pay for something. Um, and other people who are kind of at the front, in the front seats of what's going on are the people who are checking the transactions that are valid and adding them to the blockchain. So we have the users and there we have in Bitcoin, the miners or in um, a proof of stake system, people who are staking coins in order to secure the blockchain. And then in the back end, we have a whole bunch of other people who are part of the community. So you have the developers, people who are writing code to uh, fix bugs in the blockchain and actually add features to it. And then you have people who are deciding what features should be added or what issues should be addressed. And then you can even have companies around who provide add-on services who build on top of the blockchain that exists in order to provide a service in a particular industry or for a particular user base. Um, and sometimes all of these are the same. So you may have that the people who decide how the blockchain develops uh, also are the people who are then implementing it. Um, as a blockchain gets traction and becomes bigger, these parties start to separate out. So if you look at something like uh, Ethereum or Bitcoin, initially it was a small group of people hacking away at it. So they were the developers, they were the designers, they were the executive, they were also the ones who were using it. Um, as they get bigger and bigger and bigger, these, uh, these components split out and you start having foundations managing the uh, sort of the direction of the blockchain. You have coders who are just tinkering away, fixing stuff, so on and so forth. So um, again, this goes back to the community. As the community gets bigger, different sections of the community take different responsibilities in the same way that nations have this. That, uh, um, uh, if you have a, a country, it'll have a government and you will have a judiciary and an executive, um, a civil service, a police force, things like that. So uh, there's a lot of parallels there. Um, so now I'm going to touch on a few sort of individual topics that are worth investigating if you're looking to while away a weekend or a week of your life. Um, one of the concepts that has been cropping up in blockchain a lot is the concept of self-sovereign identity. So this is people looking at a blockchain and saying, well, given that identity as in who owns what um, and identity and access management is baked into blockchain, can we use it for other forms of identity? And uh, this is at the moment, a lot of work is going on to try and use uh, what is effectively self-sovereign identity. I, I prefer the term self-managed identity where you're not relying on a third party to provide your identity. Um, now, there's always going to be a need for centralized uh, managed identity in terms of 
for example, your nationality uh, or um, being able to be issued with a driving license or stuff like that. But there's a whole section of our lives now where our identities are managed by third parties and we've kind of tacitly agreed to it. So, for example, if you use something like uh, click here to log on with Facebook or with Google, so you, you have a website and you want to have an identity on it because you want to use the service and uh, you are using your Facebook identity or your Google identity or um, LinkedIn identity or whatever in order to gain access to that service. Um, there, <clears throat> one of these social media sites is providing a service, an identity service, but that comes with a risk, which is that if you get banned off that social media site for some bad behavior or just bad luck, uh, then suddenly your access to hundreds of other websites will disappear. And that's a real risk. Uh, the flip side is that you have to create a new identity for each and every website. And you can use a password manager for that. And then you have to have a, maybe you'll create a different email address for each website that you sign up to. And you will have a different password because you want to be secure and not use SolarWinds123 as your password for everything. Um, but that becomes a pain in the neck because it means you end up having to fill in the same information over and over again. Uh, and so what is a, is there a different approach to that? And the approach being put forward is, well, let's use blockchain and your, um, uh, your blockchain wallet and your blockchain address as the kind of pin holder for your identity. So now your identity is tied up with your identity on a particular blockchain. And as long as that blockchain keeps running, your identity will exist. And because of the censorship resistance that blockchains have, your identity can't be deleted. And now you can use that blockchain identity to sign up to uh, standard websites um, and avoid the problem of uh, a social media site banning your account, ending up wiping out your existence on half of the internet. So that's the kind of what's going on at the moment. And you see it already that you can use your Ethereum uh, address in a MetaMask wallet to log on to a website. Um, so I think that kind of stuff's very interesting. And then there are people thinking, well, can we replace all sorts of other things with this? Can we put academic credentials on a blockchain and tie them to your identity? Or you know, can we issue driving licenses on a blockchain? Stuff like that. But there are also a whole bunch of problems because the data that is put on a blockchain uh, can't be deleted afterwards. So how does this tie in with privacy and things like the uh, GDPR of the EU or um, the right to be forgotten and things like that? But again, I, it's one of those topics you could talk about for uh, hours and I only have, um, well, less than 20 minutes left. Um, so I'll skip through the rest of these things so we can have some real questions. Um, this, uh, yeah, we'll, incentivization is important in blockchain. You'll have heard that people mine Bitcoin. Um, that means that they're getting an incentive in the form of Bitcoin for maintaining the Bitcoin blockchain. <clears throat> All blockchains ultimately have some kind of incentivization or punishment system in order to make sure that the people who are maintaining it do so properly. Um, and that ties into the consensus system. Um, so we'll skip that. Uh, smart contracts. Um, maybe I should ask Henry, would you prefer me to talk more about industrial applications or should I discuss something such as smart contracts? I think the, um, it's quite likely, I think, that the groups working around blockchain, they will go into some of the more specifics about the tech. So I think some of kind of an overview, especially if you have any kind of industrial applications or mm -hmm. also in the public sector, something that has catched you are in the next couple of years, maybe. Okay. Like that kind of examples might be quite illuminating, I would say, for what can you do right. with blockchain. Okay, so I'll skip over the <clears throat> smart contract stuff. And um, this section starts with the idea of industry issues. And there's a writer, Jeffrey Moore, who wrote a book called Crossing the Chasm, which is looking at how a new company, a startup, makes it out of the starting gate and actually becomes a success. And ultimately, um, hopefully, as far as the founders and the VCs are concerned, into a gigantic unicorn um, company. And uh, more uh, divided the community that may use a product into innovators, early adopters, 
early majority, late majority and laggards. So that whenever you have a new technology, there's people who get all enthusiastic about it before it's proved itself. They're the innovators or the techies who just enjoy playing with it because it's technical. And then you have the early adopters who people who actually start seeing that this could be useful to the world. And they're described as visionaries. Then you have this big gap, which is the chasm, which is can it make it out of the kind of enthusiastic, optimistic followers of the technology into society in general? And uh, in that society, you can divide us into three categories, people who uh, will adopt it earlier than everybody else, but wait for it to be proved. People who once they've seen that other people who they respect have adopted, it will um, take them more to the conservatives. And then there are people at the very end, laggards, who are often described as skeptics. Um, so that's important when you're looking at industry because it kind of tells you how you can identify the market for your particular technology. And um, blockchain, I think, has now moved out of the, um, it's actually in that sort of third column. I think it's crossed the chasm given the size of activity that's going on in there. Um, and I like to look at these industry things as um, you've got naive optimists, techies who just sort of think that uh, technology is going to solve all the problems in the world. And then you have the sort of second generation technologists who found just happened to find out about it later, but ultimately they're the same as the third ones. Um, and then you have people who get enthusiastic once it's proved itself to have a business case. And the final category, I actually, when it comes to blockchain, I look at them as incumbents, um, bureaucracies, people who are too busy and people for whom the adoption of this new technology is going to threaten their existing business model. So you can think here about the music industry not liking um, MP3s or streaming because they want to sell more CDs. And uh, that business model has been working really well for them and therefore they don't want the, it to disappear. So they'll see it as a threat. And this gets particularly interesting when you're looking at blockchain because blockchain was set up to challenge existing financial systems. And the financial industry has an immense amount of control and power over our lives. This is why when we have a financial collapse, there's a lot of general hardship in society. Um, and it's been interesting to watch how the financial industry has responded to blockchain and Bitcoin. We saw this, um, I think I mentioned that here, so when you're looking at industry cases, um, you've got to remember that in any industry you look at has these incumbents who have a, an existing way of doing something and they're not going to want to change it. It could be because they don't want to lose control, which is a particular risk that blockchain poses them. It could also actually just be that the system they have works and uh, shifting to a new system is annoying. It's like moving house. You may have a better view or be closer to a lake if you move house, but on the downside, you have to pack all your stuff into boxes and get it moved from your current house to your new house. So there's a sort of activation energy to get over. So when you're looking at industry issues and can blockchain solve a problem in an industry, it's not just about, is this technically better? You also have to look at, um, is it significantly technically better or will it offer a different worldview, a different paradigm for the people in that industry? And is that one um, actually, um, people use going to disrupt uh, too much, but, uh, Will it change the, it's, I think it's better to look at it as, will it change the way people look at the world? And will it do so in a manner that either gives the world more meaning or um, uh, the capability to do stuff that they hadn't previously thought about? Um, so if we look at blockchain, I've seen this shift over the last decade that um, you had industry saying it's nonsense, it's a database is better, the way we do things at the moment are better. And then we had a, a whole range of a big company saying, well, yes, actually the underlying technology is good, um, but uh, we don't like this cryptocurrency nonsense that we're seeing. Um, a whole load of prototypes appearing. And then people were talking about, we're going to use permissioned blockchains. And the funny thing is that we've reached a point now in industry where even the industry big players are starting to realize that, hey, actually, when you have this open permissionless system, it seems to produce for some reason magically the most value. So uh, we're starting to see a remarkable mindset shift in the eyes of some companies anyway, that uh, this stuff actually creates value where there was no value before. And that's almost miraculous. How can we harness that and use that? 
Um, and in particular, I think this shift has happened. So I'm talking very generally here, um, but I think you can use this to analyze industrial applications for blockchain, um, is that uh, we get all the stuff in the media. Um, a lot of money has poured into a lot of stuff, much of which is nonsense, but some of the of which is actually revolutionary. And we've seen these sort of phases of more and more money flowing in. If you look through the history of coins, then tokens, things called ICOs. DeFi was big a year and a half ago, and NFTs are big now. In a year or two, it looks like there'll be another big thing that we can't predict yet that comes along. This is all the stuff that hits the media. Um, the problem industry has is that it now no longer hits the headlines because um, there's just such news friendly wacky stories out there to occupy all the headline space that if you come up with a particular way of improving the supply chain using blockchain uh, for handling stuff in uh, industrial ports it's not the kind of stuff journalists want to be writing about but you can dig into trade journals and um, actually academic journals even and start seeing case studies now where we're getting real tangible results as to how effective it really is and uh, suggestions as to where to move on in the future. And um, so the big areas I think are really worth looking at is logistics still. Um, there's been some work in Finland uh, from a Kovala on this and some EU funded stuff, but there's lots of projects on logistics and supply chain that are worth looking at. And it works well because logistics involves many parties and they need to build trust between each other um, and you need you have the identity of the goods that are traveling through a supply chain. And then finally, there's the uh, fact that payment systems are still inefficient. So blockchain has all the hallmarks of a solution that will help in logistics. The downside is it seems to rely on all the properties that blockchain has, which makes it a very, very complicated problem to solve. And as a result, although I think eventually it's going to be a core solution to most if not all logistics problems it's not going to come along in a hurry because there's just too much existing infrastructure that would need replacing and it's the ultimate value will appear when you have all these different components that i've just been talking about um you know, throughout the last hour coming together in a neat way in an efficient way so um this is why i'd say this is a sort of long shot one you know look at it um next one that you see a lot of activity on is the internet of things and again when you start looking at all the topics i've talked about we've got security being an issue um, devices need to have identities uh, they need to be owned by people ultimately or companies so there's ownership uh, they produce data so then there's a question of well who owns that data and finally there's this really really interesting one in terms of can these machines actually negotiate with each other and buy and sell each other services in the way that human beings currently do? So there's a really fun technical problem to go and dig into, especially since you, this means that you can actually give a machine something of value. Now, of course, you could stick your credit card on a machine and give it permission to connect to a banking API to make payments for stuff. Uh, but that, there's a lot of friction there and probably a lot of stuff in the terms and conditions that prevent it. But with a blockchain, you can instantiate tokens to represent things on a, an IoT network. And then the IoT devices can actually negotiate with each other to transfer these tokens to keep accounts of who has done what for whom. So uh, I think that's a really interesting one to look at. And again, there, there will be heaps of work going on. I find it hard to keep track of all this stuff now because it's exploded so much. Three, four years ago, I could kind of have an overview of what was going on. Um, but uh, we've reached the point where so many people are working in this space now on so many different things that no one person can keep track of it all. And my level of knowledge, therefore, that the, the lake is getting deeper, quicker than I can sort of swim around in it. So, um, you know, it's, but that's wonderful news in a sense, because it really shows that the technology has taken off. Um, then there's the social side of things, in particular, looking at government. So um, we see projects being funded by the EU on these kind of things. Um, and I see blockchain having uh, advantages for things like healthcare and benefits because it's about payments and it's about identity. Um, the tax office really should be picking up on blockchain because you could see automated taxation in the future. Um, if you 
central banks are looking at uh, trying to digitize money in the same way the blockchain does without actually dealing, uh, bringing along the uh, open, transparent and decentralized side of things. But they've noticed that although most of our money is currently digital, it's not very easy to automate stuff. And uh, they've sat up finally and taken notice that uh, blockchain tokens and blockchain currencies allow for an immense amount of scripting and automation. And uh, that is something that they see as a, a benefit. Um, but I, I want to avoid politics going into it, but I, so I'll stick to the taxation one, which is you could have a digital currency whereby your um, BAT or ALV is automatically deducted every time you make a transaction. So that would get rid of a whole huge quantity of accounting that needs to be done when companies and people transact that the ALV is just automatically siphoned off to the relevant tax authority. So there's one. And voting. Again, voting is, I think it's a very risky one because voting is very success, uh, susceptible to fraud and our voting systems have kind of evolved to deal with historical fraud issues. Um, but I do think that ultimately we will see some kind of voting on a blockchain. I'm not sure now is the right time for it, but now is certainly a good time to research it. Um, because these are all tied to identity. Um, so I think I'll summarize now, Henry, uh, which is that uh, the thing to think about when you're looking at all of these things is control. Uh, control is about who are you, what do you own, and how do you have the right to transact, and when do you have the right to transact? And uh, this is the thing ultimately that a blockchain provides, is the identity, um, who has the control, the uh, possession, what are they controlling, and then the concept of transaction, which is when have they decided to transfer that ownership to somebody else. And uh, that's my presentation. Um, can I take a moment to mention my book, Henry? Is that okay with you? Please do, please do. Right, okay. I can't see if I'm holding it up well. I do have a book on blockchain called Move Over Brokers. Here comes the blockchain. Um, it uh, does deal with the technical side of blockchain, but also the social side, and it does so through uh, the use of analogies, so that if you're very technically minded, there will be some interesting stuff in there. And if you're not technically minded, hopefully there, well, the evidence is that it contains a load of stuff that helps non-technical people understand blockchain technology in an actual meaningful manner. So you can find it on uh, Amazon if you look for my name. And it's got this very distinctive red cover with a picture of a strawberry on the front. Okay, so thanks for that opportunity, Henry. Um, and uh, that's it. I'm now open to questions. Very good. So everyone, if you have any questions to Kier, now's, now's a good chance to ask about the more technical or philosophical or economical aspects around blockchain. So also, we still have some time, but of course, if... if um, there's no questions we can of course end sooner but use the opportunity now if you if you have anything especially if you're looking into blockchain related topics in your group assignment or you have figured that one already out uh, and also for Kier, we have in the 7th of uh, february at at um, uh, 12 15 we have a workshop uh, around the european blockchain service infrastructure uh, to discuss its opportunities and also maybe some of the potential use cases uh, that it could support. So if you have a availability, please feel free to join us, but of course, no, <laughs> no harm done. If you, okay, if you, if you well, can. do send me an invite. And if I have a space in my calendar, yeah. then I will turn up. But I have to say that it's become an incredibly busy time compared yeah. to two or three years ago. Two, three years ago, I had to actively go out to look for projects to work on. And now I seem to be spending a lot of my time turning down requests for people to work on stuff. So yeah, if you are thinking of a future in blockchain, at the moment, it's looking very bright. Of course, what it's going to be like in five years, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, and in this lecture, it's one thing is to unfold some of the potentials where it's going to be heading, but also to potentially analyze the effectiveness of what has already been happening. So mm -hmm. that's what we're looking at around, uh, around these different technologies. But uh, I see that the, there's no raised hand. So last chance to ask questions from Kier. And if not, all right. Thanks a lot, Kier, for a fantastic presentation. I think it's always a delight to, 
to hear you present because uh, I think it making a complex issue to something that is un understandable it's always uh, let's say uh, it's a true gift so you're a very good speaker thanks for joining well thank you very much as usual I've really enjoyed it and uh, do feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn if uh, you have any questions and uh, you know you will also find that I I post regular pieces about blockchain on LinkedIn and actually on YouTube as well um, and I try to respond to every comment I get so that's the best way to contact me if you have any questions to ask or uh, you want an opinion on something okay thank you all okay. for attending it's been very thank nice you very much, everyone yeah. great thanks bye-bye bye-bye see you later